This video is going to be a little weird because I'm going to attempt to answer questions that nobody asks. The thing is, everybody thinks about these questions, but people typically don't ask them out loud. Or if they they do ask them, they feel like they're, you know, like they need to talk to everyone about them. And I don't know. We need to have more of a rational, reasonable conversation here. So we're going to deal with two problems in this video and. After a week of like me sleeping really great, I was up until 5 a.m. on Wednesday thinking about this. I when I stumble onto like a new territory of ideas, it overwhelms me and I can't stop thinking about it. So this video may be remade in the future because the ideas are fresh, and I may remake it with a more refined approach. But here it is for all to see. Now, two problems, right? Two main problems we're going to deal with. The first one is this: we're supposed to love everybody, all right? The Bible makes that clear. But what about marriage and, and your family? Like, do you really love everyone the same as you love them? Now, I've known people who said, well, you don't, you just, you know, you don't get married, like, because you want to love everybody. That's, that was their point of view. Now, there's a problem with that. Um, love is clearly a good thing. I think no one's going to disagree with that. If they are, then we'll have to have a different conversation, but assuming that you're not that retarded. Um, if love is a good thing, then that means that creates requirements. Okay, so first of all, you can't marry everyone because that's ridiculous. Um, that's not what marriage is. That's that's not that's a nonsense statement. Okay, so if we just hop from person to person, like if you stay with a person until eventually you move on to another person in some way, then there's a depth of commitment that you're never going to go to ever in life. So, therefore, there's a depth of love you'll never go to because love, from the Christian perspective, is all about Christ and how committed he was to us to, to, no, to no matter what point. So, without commitment, there's no love. Um, therefore, we have a problem. I mean, you, you, marriage is clearly a good thing. But at the same time, you're supposed to love everyone. The Bible's pretty clear on that. Um, the Bible in First John 4 says, if you don't love your brother whom you can see, then there's no way you love God whom you cannot see. Um, I was once in a Bible study at like a church camp where my co-teacher just out of the blue just brought up the idea and, and, def and, one, and defended it that God doesn't love everybody. And his argument was that since he doesn't love everyone, but he just loves his own family, then God does the same thing. God doesn't love the people that go to hell, only the people that go to heaven. No joke. Um, no joke. That's what he said. And then he looked at me and said, I bet Ben has something he wants to say about that. No, I'm not going to say anything about that. Are you kidding? <sighs> Anyways. Um, <laughs> to answer this question, all right, it's best if I answer another question. So we set up a problem, and the way we're going to resolve it is to bring in a new problem. <laughs> I'm reminded of a rabbi who was asked, uh, why do you always answer a question with a question? To which he replied, why shouldn't I answer a question with a question? <laughs> so, the new question we need to bring in is, why does God love us? If we say God loves us because we deserve it somehow, we run into problems. That's not unconditional love, and it, and it doesn't fit well at all with the idea of Jesus Christ dying on the cross to be punished in our place. That There's no room in that scenario for you to deserve that. Okay, we need to be as clear as possible about this. God's own kind of love, that's what it said in Romans 5 8. God demonstrates his own kind of love to us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Alright? It's never something that you earned or deserved. But, 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 take a look at 1 John 16. 1 John 4 16. So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Now, that's a good word from John. It says God is love, so God is love. Now, we may try to resolve the problem like this. God loves us because just that's who he is. He is love. That's just what he does. But then that, that doesn't really resolve the problem. It creates a, It just resolves it in a way that has a new issue. All right? So... Does God just love us because that's just what he does? I mean, hold on. I mean, that leaves tons of problems. That doesn't really take you into account. Does God love you? Or is love just what he does? Does who you are matter to God? Consider what you've done and the choices you have made. Is all that meaningless to God? 
He just, eh, whatever you do, I just love you. I mean, is that... Would God really say he loves you? Because it doesn't matter who you are? I mean, does that sound like real love? Now, to explain this point a little further, I'm going to borrow from uh, Christian apologist Michael Ramsden. Imagine you're in school, and the person you most like tells you that he or she loves you. Now, take a second to think about how that would make you feel. This person's you most like says to you, I love you. Okay? Think about how that would make you feel. Now imagine you come back to school the next day, because that's how school works, right? And you see the same person telling someone else, I love you. Now how do you feel? The issue is that the words, I love you, only mean something when they are directed specifically towards you. Uh, Christian apologist uh, Ravi Zacharias, who works with Michael Ramsden, or Michael Ramsden works for Ravi, I think, <laughs> he explains this same point with a personal story. So we'll try to drive this point home. He travels the world a lot for his job. He's gone from home a lot. All right. Once when he returned home, he came into the kitchen and he found his two-year-old daughter in a walker on the floor and his mother sitting at the table. His daughter saw him and got a very confused look. She studied him for a while, basically wondering, who is this guy? Then she ran to hug him. And he said in that moment, he had more insight into what love is than all the books he had ever read. All right, so love doesn't mean anything unless it's directed specifically towards you. That was the point that he drew from that. And I, th- I think we need, we need to grasp that. So this idea that God loves us just because that's what he always does, that's not real love either. So we, we introduce the problem. We try to resolve it by introducing another problem, a different question. But then that brought in more problems. All right. So now I'm going to make you hate me, and we're going to answer it all with like a third problem. <laughs> but it will, it will. This one we won't. There won't be any. This is the last. You know, we're not going to roll this into a fourth one. <laughs> um. So the question is, problem three: Why does God send people to hell if He loves us? All right. Now, I'm going to try to answer this one quickly. I have an entire like separate video just on this question. I'll link to it in the description and all that. Our choices are meaningful to God. All right? They carry weight and meaning in it, even the bad ones. In other words, if God didn't care what we did, then he wouldn't punish us and he wouldn't punish Jesus. He would just say, "Eh, go to heaven." But the fact the fact that God does punish us, and Jesus has to die for for us to be forgiven, means that what we do has meaning to God. In fact, this was my answer to the guy at camp that time. Therefore, his love is unconditional. Right? Because he loves the sinner. But it also... I mean, there's the only people that get forgiven, right? <laughs> but it also matters who we are. It's not that who you are doesn't matter, but it's also unconditional. So the unconditionality, but also the fact that your choices have meaning and weight, those two meet and make perfect sense in this scenario. So this is the answer of why God loves us. I hope everybody follows that. Now, now that we've kind of resolved that, we can use that understanding of that kind of the way that the two opposite ends of the spectrum come together in God's own kind of love we can move back to question one. All right, so it's always important to nail down the things you know for sure to be true. Never lose sight of those. So it's important to understand we are to love everyone. That's clear. So if you're teaching a Bible study with me and wondering what I think about that, you don't have to wonder anymore, okay? This is what I think. You're supposed to love everyone. All right. Now, marriage is literally like a partnership on like just living life itself. Right. So, therefore, it makes sense to choose a person that you would find it easy to love. Um, the closer you get to somebody, the more time you spend, the more you, I mean, you're, you're going to, there's going to be flaws that you don't know about at first, bad things with that person, and bad things about yourself that are just going to come out. 
And like, you're gonna have to deal with them. So there's going to be difficulty. It's impossible for there not to be difficulty. And you're not gonna last very long through the difficulty if loving that person doesn't come easily. In other words, some people are just gonna be easier to love, at least for you, than other people. Now, let's infer. Let's take our idea of love from the example of Christ's love, as we have discussed, and then move into this idea and apply it to the love in the family unit. Right. <laughs> The family unit it sounds like a building block for some kind of machine. Anyways, so <laughs> your choices in life have meaning for God. Otherwise, nobody would be punished or forgiven. We aren't. We're not just pets. We're not God's pets. What we do carries weight and importance to God. In fact, it couldn't be more important to God. He couldn't take it more seriously. Therefore, your partner in life. All right. And the choices of this person must have meaning for you. All right, so that that is something we can nail down. We know your partner, the choices in the, of this person must have meaning for you. That is something of which we can be sure. All right, now we must recognize that some people's choices will carry more meaning for you than those of other people. <clears throat> this is because you're not God. You don't know everything. You can't be involved in like every possible mission and every possible goal in life. All right? God may God is divine. You are limited. I am limited. We are humans. All right? So we all are going to have certain things in life that like determined who we are or what what is meaningful to us. More spe- specifically meaningful to us. In other words, some things are what really matters to you. And it's all important to God. But you can't really know or be concerned about everything. You have to have certain values and choices that sort of define you. So once you know what is meaningful to you, then you can look at other people and see what is meaningful to them. You can see if what makes a difference to that person has any meaning for what matters to you. Alright? This cannot happen unless you really understand the other person really well. Okay? And when you, when, when that, when that is reciprocated, when two people understand one another really well, the word for that is intimacy. Alright. Alright, so, the thing is, how does the process work? I mean, there's some things we can know. I mean, obviously there's tons of variety, but to recognize this in another person, you're going to have to take who you are and your choices into, into account. We all have a different road to hoe in life, you know, as the old farm saying goes. We all have different goals and missions in life. We can, we can respect other people's missions and what matters to them. We don't have to say, you know, that's not my thing, so I hate that, you know. But we have to pick something that's more meaningful for ourselves. It's kind of like an aspect of God to which we are really committed. And in the ancient world, they would have said, you know, a separate God, and like, this is my God, you know, Nike is my God, the God of winning and sports. That's, that was her, that's who, that's who Nike was. She was the God of winning. Um, and then this other guy was dedicated to Dionysius, the God of getting drunk and high, you know. Um, in a monotheistic aspect, it, with a monotheistic God, there's one God, but he covers everything. Okay. So there's different sort of different aspects of God. <clears throat> We are committed to the, there, there needs to be something, like an aspect of God, to which we are committed. And we are committed to the importance of it, of whatever it is, and how we live our life. Now you have to take that into account, and how that relates to your own self, and then try to see how that relates to the other person. And this doesn't mean that you choose a person who's the same as you. It may mean that, it may not mean that, right? In any field, or any professional, and you ask them a question like that, they're, that, you know, that, I don't know. And I don't care if it's plumbing, they'll say, it depends, you know, as a landscaper, I, a lot of times like, people ask me about this and that, and I just say, it depends, right? Because it does depend on things. It depends on what's meaningful for you. In some cases, the best choice may be someone very different. It depends on what you're like and what your thing is. In some cases, it may be someone very much the same as you, right? But it's important to understand, you're going to have to come to agreements on important decisions with this person, or the whole thing is a waste of time. <clears throat> Now, if we have all this in mind, we can start looking, I guess, or have an idea for what you're looking for. But you run into problems like super fast. 
what specifically, what exactly are you looking for? As you, as soon as you like try to explain what it is you're specifically looking for, then the limitations of words become obvious. Words are too specific. So say you make a statement about another person's life and how what matters to him or her is meaningful to you. You, you, all right, so you're trying to, you found someone, you think you got an idea that like, yeah, this is person's right fit. And you make a statement trying to explain why they're a right fit. As soon as you do that, you will instantly think of a thousand ways you might be wrong. And the reason this is, is because it's never one reason. It's never one thing that you can sum up in a sentence. It's all of the reasons together all at once. There's no sentence in that you can, there's no, there isn't, that is limitation of language. There is no sentence that can sum up who a person is. Alright? G.K. Chesterton, uh, one of my favorite authors. I want to go back and read Orthodoxy again. Why not? Um, for the third time. Alright? He explained this type of problem this way. Suppose you were to tell someone were to, come to want to have an argument with you, and, t- and this person is tell you, anarchy uh, is superior to civilization. Some dude comes up and tells you that anarchy, run around lawlessness, is better than law and order. Now, if you give him one reason why he's wrong, he will easily shoot down that one reason. He'll find a loophole or some way around it. If you give him, like, an answer to that by, you, by bringing in, like, an extra fact, an extra point into this conversation, then he will give you another reason why that extra point is wrong. And then you'll have to bring in like a third fact, a third thing. And then he'll bring in an extra thing. And he'll keep going in this chain. Eventually you're going to start forgetting the earlier points. Both of you will and begin to repeat them. And you'll go in circles and get nowhere. But it'll be very exhausting. The problem is that there is no one single reason why. It's all the reasons together as one that are the real reason why. So I hope you can see the connection to understanding a person. and, And especially choosing you know, marriage and all that. Okay, so, this does not mean that the person you're looking for is necessarily just exactly the same as you. I think we said that before. Rather, that the person's choices carry meaning for your own. Alright, what I'm hoping to lay out here is an explanation of what people, what I think people do all the time. I think most people feel their way through this, and they're not real sure about how to put to words what they're already doing, what's going on. And I'm hoping that, you know, someone, that, that people in general will at some point in the future benefit from seeing this process explained in fairly simple words instead of feeling it out. Because I think as we feel it out, the issue is, is that if I don't put it to words and, and try to do a good job, then someone else will come in and explain the situation and insert his or her own destructive ideas. And that's something I see that's dangerous about the Hunger Games. But we will get to that later. We need to pay attention and notice a few things. All right. So let, let, let's analyze what we've set up. You cannot find this meaningfulness in another person if you do not interact with people. There are a billion people in China. You're not going to fall in love with any of them. In fact, if you die, none of them will care or even be aware of it. Interaction is essential. But you have to interact with a lot of people because you have no idea who, who it is until you find out, right? I mean, so the problem is time is limited. You're not God. You have a limited amount of time, resources to spend, and you got to, and you're on this search, right? <laughs> so your interaction is going to therefore be limited, right? So Therefore, you, you're going, you and this person need to have some degree of like compatibility. And I mean, that can mean a million things. But what I mean when I say compatibility in this specific point of reason, there needs to be a degree at which the special meaningfulness that we've talked about must be easily observed with only a limited amount of interaction. Okay? And there's a lot of ways that could come out. It could, it could be through your, I mean, there's a ton of things. All right, so we're not going to list examples. So we're going forever. To say it simply, I mean, the person has needs to stick out of the crowd. All right, now, therefore, it makes perfect sense for like the basic male 
and female personalities to be very different. This would make the compatibility stick out more clearly when it does exist. Because it would be like, whoa, that's not normal. What's normal is we're so, girls are so incompatible. All of a sudden, you know, or guys, you know, now all of a sudden this person, you know, you see what I'm saying? All right, so, if, if there was like a common, you know, similar personality, if they were really similar between male and female, then there would be like a common level of compatibility it makes it, that would make it hard to notice anyone in particular. In other words, the special person would be harder to notice. So, so notice. So it's good that women, men, women and men are so different, because otherwise they would have a really hard time coming together and finding someone in, who's special if it was not this way. Hmm. So in other words, it makes sense to divide humans into these two groups who are, and we can call them male and female. But if you were to create humans and you wanted them to do the marriage thing, then like. It would make, and we gave a logical argument for the marriage thing based on the fact that just love is a good thing. So therefore, it makes sense to divide them into two groups. So in other words, it would appear that heterosexuality is, heterosexual marriage is what is intended and better. As is kind of a beginning of an argument there. Um, but this is the thing, because these two groups are so different, this will also lead to them interacting less. Different shared values, different ideals, different uh, shared activities. You know, I'm not going to take cheerleading pictures or do my nails, you know, or whatever. And so, like, and she's not going to have her hands all super dirty learning to change the disc brakes when she's six years old. Okay. So, I mean, stuff like that leads to less interaction. <laughs> Therefore, it seems clear that sexual attraction becomes a needed tool to get the two groups together. Otherwise, the whole process would be defeated. Hmm. The funny thing is that we appear to have stumbled on a side argument against homosexual marriage. Since love is a good thing, then marriage is a good thing. Otherwise, there is a level of commitment you will never go to. And it appears that the marriage thing works best when the radical difference is of heterosexuals than it does with homosexuals. This really needs separate treatment at another time. So we're, we're going to move on. Back to the issue at hand. If you find such a person, then you have found someone that you should love in a special way. In other words, if you found such a person, then you are morally obligated to go, you know, you should love that person. If, if you have found such a person. Which is always a bit iffy, right? <laughs> so, in other words, if I'm correct, then we can have some idea about what we are looking for with some degree of confidence. I'll never forget, there was this time uh, when a friend of mine, he was treated like really badly by this online girlfriend that he had. I won't go into the details, but after it all fell apart, uh, he went on a, like a month-long tirade, and all we ever heard is every day, you know, all he wanted to talk about was how romantic love doesn't exist. Because you have no way to really define what it is. So, I hope uh, that maybe I've given some new information on defining what it is here. Trying to deal with some of the problems that arise. Now, it's important to note that like Christ... Alright, this is, this is really important. Alright? If it's Christian love, then you will love them... And you will love them, the bad things, as much as the good. Not that you love the bad that they do, but that won't make you stop loving them at all. It's unconditional, right? So, this is how Christ's love work. It's important to understand. For Christ, our evil choices carry weight and meaning to Him. He dies for our evil choices. Alright, if they didn't matter to Him... It, but he, you know, he liked this anyway. Then he would just wave his hand and say, "Yeah, go on to heaven. I'm not going to die for your sins. Just go." But the fact that he dies for our sins means that our choices are important and they, they mean something to him. So we understand that you need to have this kind of love for whoever your spouse is, right? Your family in general, right? But the entire process. This is the thing, right? Think about this. The entire process of choosing a spouse. 
means rejecting a lot of people unless you're Adam and Eve, right? You're going to be sifting through a lot of people and there's going to be tons of people you reject. Now, aren't we supposed to love everybody? I mean, I don't, where's this Christian love thing of like, I'll die for your sins, but also I'm going to reject most people. You see, this is a real issue. And as I raise this issue, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that you'll be able to look back over what we have discussed and see how it answers it. In other words, this would be a good time to like pause and try to rethink what we've already talked about. Think of this as like the example problem in the science book. Okay. Now, moving on, there's still another question left to answer. To really form a partnership, like on life in general, then trust is essential, right? All right. And all we're going to do is we're we're going to make the problem we brought up a minute ago even more biting. All right. If this person is going to be the parent to your children, then it is your duty to pick the best person you can, right? Because because you love your kids, right? Or your imaginary kids. So, therefore, it's your duty to pick the best person you can. Now we have a problem again. How can we choose the person based on love, but also choose the best person we can? Do you see the problem God is love, and God's kind of love is unconditional, and God dies for our sins. Now, somebody out there may resolve this and say, well, if that person is untrustworthy and not, you know, I can't count on them, and then I still love them, but I'm just not going to marry them. That doesn't resolve the problem at all. Isn't the real motivation for the marriage really just, I love you? Isn't that really what it boils down to at the end of the day? That's why you chose that person? I mean, do those words, I love you, mean anything? Are we just selecting a person who's most qualified for a job? A really, it's a really important job, but you are the most qualified. All these other ones got rejected, right? Where's the I love you in that? And then, then where's the I love you in the, the fact that you chose to marry the person? You see? So, therefore, we have a new problem. Yes. This is our fourth and final problem. Love means... Loving someone regardless of whether they wrong you. Alright? I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Love Story, but unlike The Hunger Games, which we're going to talk about in a minute, Love Story gets it right. Uh, the man in the story basically wrongs the girl, and he lets her down in a big way, and he he tries his best to make it up to her and apologize to her, and she stops him in the middle of the apology. This is the most corny line ever, but she says... Love means never having to say you're sorry. Never having to earn any, you don't have to earn any love from me. You don't have to earn it at all. It's never earned. And that's Christian love. It's never earned. You do not earn it. <laughs> but trust is essential to the marriage partnership. And, and you do owe it to your children that they will have the best mother or father that they can. Hmm. So we got a conundrum, right? But this conundrum, the solution is like there in what we've discussed earlier. We just need to ponder a little further. Just just think for a second, okay? If you find a person who meets these requirements as we have discussed earlier, then you should love that person. Nonetheless, you are not married unless that person returns the favor. In other words, unless they reciprocate. Unless they do it back. They should do it back. Because if you are correct in your assessment of the situation, then you then you should love them, and that means that they should love you too. But they may they don't. It's choice, right? They may not do it. And if if they don't do it, in other words, if a person violates your trust, even though you love them, then you are essentially divorced already. You are not the one who's doing the rejecting. So if this person violates your trust, and then you end the relationship. You're not really the one who ended it. You're just the one who's willing to put to words what has already happened. The person who violated the trust is the one who decided to stop loving and broke the relationship. If the love relationship is not reciprocal, then the marriage does not exist. It's not about whether or not it should exist. It does not exist. Alright? And it's just a question of whether you're in denial about reality or not. And this... Brings us to what troubles me about the Hunger Games. 
Uh, uh, now, I've never read the books, okay? And I've only seen, like, the first movie and the fourth film, right? So, the amazing thing was, I don't really think I missed much. <laughs> um, everything in the story appeared to have played itself out pretty much how it set itself up in the first film. It's obviously Evil Empire, Freedom Fighters, um, blah, 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 and she's got to pick which dude she likes the most. That was set up in the first movie, and it, it all came to be. Right. Ultimately, the main character, Katniss, she chooses a husband based on what she calls a record of all that person does. <laughs> Alright, she calls it the record of all that person does. Now, the author apparently loves yuppie names. I mean, Katniss, and then the male characters are Pita, Pita, and Gail. I mean, if you're not laughing, you have no sense of humor. That is hilarious. That is the most yuppie thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I bet her name is like the most British, milk toasty, white sounding name you've ever heard. And then she's going to come up with these like, listen, listen, their names are Catherine and Peter. Okay. Those are the characters names. Just embrace your Englishness <laughs> or at least admit it. I know you're living in this fantasy future, but it's the names are Catherine and Peter, and then Gail. What the heck? Like, that's what my grandma's sister would be named. Oh wait, her name's Faye. Why don't you name him Faye? Faye. The dude's name Faye. <laughs> I mean, can't he just be Peter? Stop trying to pretend to be exotic. I mean, it, it, seriously, Gail. Ima imagine that you're walking down a dark alley in a dangerous part of town, all by yourself, and you see two men walking your way. You can't tell who they are. They're in the darkness. You're probably a little scared. But then you find out that their names are Peta and Gail. <laughs> are you are you as scared anymore? <laughs> or if his name was Wesley, like no one's afraid of somebody named Wesley, <laughs> which isn't it's not a yuppie name at all, right? But anyway, um, back normal, back normal. Now, as the story goes, Peter proves to Catherine more he proves to love her more and therefore he wins her love and they live happily ever after the lesson of the story is it, it, trying to drive the point is that the hand Peter was dealt in life is not his fault what matters is that he loves Katniss more than the other guy does alright now that is a great point you can, we can all get behind that. We can all get behind, you know, the motivations of the movie and Katniss and everyone to, like, take over the evil empire. You know, because the evil empire is evil. We, we all get the freedom fighter concept. The problem is, is the story seems to sneak in a much more scary and dark and twisted point at the same time. It says that love is earned. Peter earns Catherine's love by his own personal virtue and love for her. That is the most unchristian thing I have ever heard. It's horrible. My friends, love is never earned. Who among you can really say that he or she deserves the love of Christ? Stories like this make you believe that the devil is real. You know, Satan's out there. You catch more flies with honey than with vinegar in, a, in, in this sort of, this, this Hunger Games saga, Vulcan saga, Viking, right? Mixes in so many, like, good things that you want to get behind, but then it, it all, like, it sneaks in and, and the, the crescendo, in the crucial moment, something that says that you have to earn love. Satan, I see you, and I see you using people to get your message out. As always, you have my middle finger of support. So, I, I hope this kind of brings out the conundrum. Like, there is a conundrum here. We can't... Love means never having to say you're sorry. But then you have to reject tons of people and pick someone. So, you, you, this, you don't resolve it by saying that this person loves me more so they earn my love. Like, that is not how it works. That is not how it works. Um, and this, this video that I've set up is just the beginning to try and resolve these problems. Um, 
I hope that they make some sense, and at the very least, I hope that I brought out the problems that probably get ignored a lot. I hope everyone who watches this video takes these questions and issues to heart. I understand that there are probably very few people who will watch it. It's something that I've thought about not just the other night, but for years, and just slowly you come to no notice more and more things. But I, I, we need to end the video and just say, God bless you.